Hey, I hope that you uh, really see the value that we as a church are placing into the next generation. All the camps that we're doing this summer, we really want to invest and pour into and create a, a healthy culture of new, young, strong believers. So thank you for being behind that and supporting that with your resources. I don't know if you realize it, but Rhett, who led us in worship, he's our high school pastor. And uh, Milo on drums is a sophomore in high school. Nikki playing violin is a freshman in high school. So uh, Pat is not in high school anymore, but still, <laughs> you did a good job, Pat, today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just really want to be a church that pours into the next generation and see uh, God's anointing upon them and, and invest in them. So thank you for being a part of that. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. As you're turning there, I'd love to just introduce myself. If you're first time here, my name is Nate, one of the pastors at this incredible faith family called Anthem Chapel. We believe that from the very beginning, back in 2018, that God gave us a vision to proclaim the name of Jesus, that all would look to him and be saved. Our desire is, as a faith family, uh, to learn how to love and live just like Jesus did. Uh, so that's what we're here to do. And we're going through the book of Romans. We believe that God's word is applicable for today. It's full of truth. It instructs and corrects. We live by the word. We teach the word. We're instructed by the word. Uh, and so as we're in the book of Romans, we do believe that God is going to uh, and has been instructing us and encouraging us in great ways. Um, unfortunately, I tried to do my study notes this morning. The app wasn't working, but hopefully you know you have this free journal for you guys. We are giving this out to you as we kind of go through the book of Romans. The title of the theme of this series is This Changes Everything. We do believe if we want to experience something different from, uh, different from last year, we need to endeavor to do something different this year. And so we want to challenge you to journal and, and take study notes and memorize scripture as we go through the book of Romans. And I mentioned last week, I am a holler back preacher. I love to have the, 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 you guys speak back to me. But Romans is not really one of those amen kind of books. It's like a oh my kind of book, you know. And uh, we are actually again in chapter 2 wading through some, some heaviness, to be honest. Um, the title of today's message is uh, Check the Labels. Check the Labels. Romans chapter 2. Let's check it out. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. Uh, my goal today is to finish chapter 2 all the way. Yes, lots of verses, but I do believe it is um, uh, possible to do. Uh, next week, we have one of our elders, Mike Ryder, preaching uh, next week, starting chapter 3. Where's Big Mike in the house? He's around here somewhere. There he is. Yes. Looking forward to that. Chapter 3 doesn't quite get any better just yet, uh, but, you know, still kind of heavy. But here we go. God's word for us today. Verse 11. For God shows no partiality. Verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who were righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. What a verse that is. We'll stop right there and pray. Would you join me as we pray over our time? Uh, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together in this place, in this high, uh, junior high theater. Uh, we can't really get over the fact that Monday through Friday, this is filled with junior hires. But today, it's filled with your people. The people of God, opening up the word of God, being filled and instructed by the spirit of God that we might become more like the Son of God. So would you instruct us this morning, not my word, but your word in this place. We love you, Father. We love you. We praise you. Speak to us today. We need desperately to hear a word from you. 
This culture is grinding us. We need to be spirit-filled, spirit-led, infused with power from on high. We ask that you would give it to us even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Check your labels. Check the label. I'm not sure if in your home you um, reuse different containers for different things when you're doing leftovers. Uh, maybe you're using a mayonnaise jar to put some soup in, and hopefully it's recognizable that it's no more mayonnaise in there, but soup instead. Or um, maybe you, uh, you know, recently my son Bo was uh, looking for avocados. This is a true story, and he thought that uh, wasabi was avocado. He needed to check the label a little bit on that. Uh, some of you guys uh, are aware my oldest daughter is turning 16 in just a few weeks. I can't believe it. And we've been on the car search, you know, looking for some different cars. And used cars, man, let me tell you, you got to check the label on those bad boys. You go online and things look really crisp and really clean. They got that filter on that used car. But when you see it in person, it's quite a different story. And I'm not a mechanic. And, you know, when I'm looking at cars, I just, I, I, Pop the hood. I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but yep, there's the engine. It's right there. It's got belts and spinny things and some fluid in that bucket. And uh, uh, but check your labels. Check your labels. In our text before us, what we're going to see is we're going to have like a little heart health check. A heart health check. We need to check to make sure the label on the outside of who we are lines up with what's on the inside. Because God cares about what's on the inside. In fact, would you mind just looking at the last verse in chapter 2? The last verse in chapter 2 says this, which is verse 29, says, uh, But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. It's a matter of the heart. Check your label. It's who we say we are, line up with who we really are. And in the past few weeks, Paul, as we've been going through Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, he's described to us two groups of people that resist and refuse the gospel. Uh, we looked at chapter 1, and you could maybe call this group of people maybe kind of obvious, you know, Captain Obvious people. These are people that are blatantly disregarding God's goodness and grace and his law. We read in chapter 1 that there's a group of people that are just wicked and, and refusing to obey and inventors of evil and covetousness and disobedient to their parents. Remember, Paul listed this incredible list of just sins that people are blatantly, obviously doing. And Paul says those are, that group of people, definitely, God's going to deal with them. Last week, we talked about a different group of people. Maybe not so obvious. Maybe we'd have the word, uh, maybe self-righteous kind of people that judge others while doing the same thing themselves. And you might remember last week, we looked at the way to think about this. Is chapter one, remember the prodigal of the, par uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the younger son is an obvious sinner. He disobeys his father and goes and wastes his life on prodigal living and wasteful living. And he comes under judgment and finds himself in a desperate and dire situation. Chapter 1 of Romans describes like that type of person, a younger son, disobedient. But remember, Jesus says there was also was the older son, the elder son in the parable of the prodigal son. And the elder son maybe was kind of more righteous, self-righteous, Never disobeyed his father, but also was outside the house, separate from his father. And Paul kind of describes Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, two groups of people, kind of outright sinners and self-righteous people that think they're better than others. They compare themselves with other people, thinking that God judges on a curve when in fact he does not. And so Paul continues with this kind of thinking in the rest of the verses we have before us. And he, I want us just to kind of be aware of something. Look, look at verse 16. We're going to, again, think about the heart check here. Look at a couple things. But first, look at verse 16. He says, now on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Again, we see the word judge there. You see that there? God judges. And so far, if you kind of maybe can recall, Paul's made three kind of big statements in regards to God's judgment. 
First, in verse 2, Paul would say that God's judgment is according to truth. And I'm reading out the ESV version, and verse 2 reads like this in the ESV. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, wickedness and evil. Rightly falls. The New King James or the NIV would say that God's judgment is according to truth. God judges with, based upon reality, like what's really going on in the lives of men and women. We talked about this idea that God has, he is good, but in his goodness, he must judge sin. Uh, Lars talk, started this whole kind of series, uh, this whole idea off talking about God's wrath, that God has this, there's this punishment against sin. God cannot be neutral against evil. And so though God is good, a good God must judge sin. Sin, right, is anything that we say or think or do that displeases God. Sin always pushes us away from wholeness, away from, from peace. I've said it before, I'll keep saying it again. Sin always costs us more than we wanted to pay. Sin always keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. Sin always, uh, uh, what's the third one? I'm, gonna, I'm kind of messing it up. Keeps us, yeah, good, Val, good job. Takes us farther than we wanted to go. Sin always does that. And a judge who refuses to punish evil is not a good judge. So God judges according to truth, verse 2. But Paul also says that God judges according to works, verse 6. It says he will render to each one according to his works. Kind of an interesting thought there. We talked about this last week, this idea that we know that as Christians, followers of Jesus, that we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved through faith alone, but a faith that saves, right, is never alone. That there needs to be a evidence of our faith. Just like an apple on an apple tree proves that that tree is alive. We need to have some actual outward behavior it needs to line up with the inward belief. And so God judges according to works. Like, okay, is, is this matching up here? And also, thirdly, Paul will say God judges according to light, to light. This is verse 11, verse 12. Verse 11 says, so God shows no partiality for all who have sinned, verse 12, without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Paul's kind of saying, listen, describes that the whole world falls under the judgment of God, okay? So you say, okay, well, well what about the person? We've talked about the outright sinner. We've talked about the self-righteous person that's still sinning. But what about the person like on the island all by themselves that's never heard about God, never, never heard about God's law and, and who God is? Like, what about that person, right? Well, Paul kind of talks about that. that's what verse 11 and 12 is all about, right? God shows no partiality, right? Verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. I remember earlier in Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about that creation itself exclaims and declares that there is a creator God. Talk about not only does creation declare that there is a creator, but our own conscience declares there is a creator. We innately know right and wrong and good and bad. And the fact is, is that God is a fair judge. He judges according to light, meaning what has been revealed to an individual to what extent has a person been revealed to God's standard? And to, to that extent, God will judge. People will be responsible to God for what God has already revealed to them. He, he judges according to light. And so the person all by themselves in an island, God's going to judge accordingly in that situation. He's going to make the right call there. What's been revealed by creation in their own conscience, God judges accordingly. Now look at the text, verse 16, he kind of wraps this all idea. He says again, so on that day, on that day, when judgment comes according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men. And this is where we kind of begin the, the, the text today. He judges the secrets of men. The word there for secret is the word crypto. It means hidden. It means that inner life. And so Paul wants us to do a heart check. Like where do we line up? Like where are we at today? Are we the outright blatant sinner? Are we the self-righteous person 
thinking that we're going to earn our way to heaven. Like, where do we line up? Heart check. Remember when you would go to CVS um, or Rite Aid, they had that little machine. You could put your little arm, the arm cuff machine, and you could put your arm through it, and it would, you know, you press the button, and it would inflate, and it would take your uh, blood pressure. Like, that's kind of what we're doing. Let's do a little check here. Is it possible to trust in Christianity rather than Christ it's himself? Is it possible that we can get caught up in the doing rather than the being? Because it's the inner life that matters. Check the label. What's going on inside? So just three, three quick thoughts for us this morning. This idea of, of our assets. What, 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 what do we have going for us? What's against us? And finally, God who gives the appraisal of us. Verse 17, I want you to think about this as assets. This is what the Jewish people had going for them. And we'll read this first. Verse 17 says this. So Paul says, listen, you call yourself a Jew. You rely on the law. You boast in God. Verse 18, you know his will. You approve what's excellent. You're instructed from the law. Verse 19, you're sure that you yourselves are a guide to the blind. You're a light to those who are in darkness. You're an instructor of the foolish. You're a teacher of children. You have the law, uh, having in the law the embodiment and knowledge and truth. So Paul speaking to the Jew at this moment, he lists eight things that, listen, you guys are probably thinking to yourself, we're not chapter one people. We're not early chapter two people. Like we're, like we're doing pretty good. And so Paul lists these eight things, and I kind of break them down into three little categories. They had the right background. Verse 7, Paul says, you guys call yourselves Jews, right? Jew was a name that came from the tribe of Judah. It means to praise. They were like, you, you guys are part of this background that of, of all the people, of all the nations, God chose the nation, of, chose you to become a nation, and that's, that's, that's pretty cool. That's, a good, that's good. You guys call yourselves a Jew. You're part of this great background. You're his special treasure. You're his special people. You got the right book, verse 17. You call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law. Right? Like of all the nations, God gave the Jewish people scripture, his word, Moses and the Ten Commandments. Like of all the people, God gave it to the Jews. You got the right background. You got the right book. You got the right business. Verse 19, 18, 19, 20. You guys know his will. You approve what's excellent. You're, you're, what's it say? You're a light to those who are in darkness. You're an instructor of the foolish. You're a teacher to children. Like, man, you got some pretty good assets, guys. Now let's let their story become our story, right? We can say, hey, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a little Christ. That's, that's who I am. I got the t-shirt on and everything. I got the anthem sticker on the back of my car. Let everybody know what's up. I got that. We have a book. I got so many versions of the Bible. I got so many. ESV, NIV, NKJV. If you're big time in the NASB 2020 version, the most updated version of that one. You got it on your phone. You got all the different stuff. Like, we, man, we're, I'm in there. Got the right business. Like, yes, I'm trying to, to tell people about Jesus. We got Easter coming up. I'm going to get the flyer. I'm going to pass it all around. I can't wait to do that. Good. This is all good stuff. These are all great things. Great things to be a part of. Paul's like, good. These are some great assets that you guys have. But can I press a little deeper? Look what he says. This is heart health. Let's check the heart. Let's press a little deeper. What do these things have against you, possibly, if you're a pros and cons kind of person? The pros are right background, right book, right business, doing good. What's on the con side? What do we have against us? Verse 21. But Paul says this, but you then who teach others, oh, do you not teach yourself? I mean, you're preaching against stealing, but do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? Right, he's pressing a little deeper here. You who abhor idols, but do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. So he's pushing a little bit deeper. Again, remember Paul's point here is he's painting a very dark background still. He's still painting a dark background. 
It's going to be hard to admit your need for a Savior until you acknowledge you, you're a sinner in need of one. You might not admit that you need a message of hope until you acknowledge that you need help, right? That's, that's the whole background of this, this entire chapter still. And when Mike Ryder brings us to chapter 3, it's still going to be a little bit of this flavor. But soon, soon, Paul's going to be writing about the, the glorious gospel. Thank you, Jesus. But he wants us to be a people. It's hard to, to, to appreciate the good news until we've apprehended the bad news. That's the whole idea. It's still here. So he says, listen, this is, you have the wrong practice. This is what's against you. Your behavior isn't matching up with your belief. You, you say that you're a light to the blind and a teacher to children. You say these things, but are you actually doing them? Check the label. God's not impressed when those two things don't line up. When belief and behavior do not line up, he, he, he's not happy. It's not, it's not something he's excited about. In fact, you might remember Jesus' harshest words were to the Pharisees on this exact type of thing when behavior and belief doesn't line up. Matthew 23 and verse 27, write this in the margin of your Bible or write in your notes. Jesus says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders of the day. You're hypocrites. For you're like whitewashed tombs. You outwardly appear very beautiful doing all these great things. But within, how gnarly is this? You're full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. Outwardly you appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Check your label. Is it, is it lining up? Is it lining up? Heart health check. A lot, of, a lot of benefits, a lot of good stuff, but is it actually matching up to how you're actually living your life? There's a, a, a German cathedral in a town called like Lut, Lutke, or I don't really know, whatever, in Germany. And um, there's an inscription on the back of the door, and I thought it was kind of fitting to this little moment. It reads this way. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and you see me not. You call me the way and you walk not. You call me life and you desire me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair but love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me gracious, trust me not. You call me noble, and serve me not. You call me mighty, and honor me not. You call me just, and fear me not. So if I condemn you, blame me not. Gnarly, right? To put in the wall of a church. That's why verse 24 in Romans 2 says this, it's written, the name of God is blasphemed, among the Gentiles because of you. When your life is not one of integrity, integrity and in integer, right, one, when, it's, when the label doesn't match up with what's inside, with what's inside doesn't match up with the label. It's hypocrisy, it's not correct, it's not integrity, it's not oneness. And it gives God a bad name, is what verse 24 says. That's what's so heartbreaking about like David and, uh, David and uh, Bathsheba, Here's King David. We know how much he loved God. He worshiped God. So many psalms that he would just write. But when he had that grievous sin with Bathsheba, it, it, in a sense, it just, it just tainted, in a sense, the reputation of God amongst the nations. King David did that. King David did that. And it just, that's why verse 24, when, when you live hypocritically, when your, light, your, heart, your heart health is not lined up, you're bla the name of God is blasphemed. Isn't that what's so heartbreaking about church leaders that fall? And, or not just church leaders, you know, that, they get the most publicity, but just in general, when, when a follower of Jesus falls publicly and gnarly things happen, it's just it's such a bummer because it's it, it, in a sense, right? It's like dragging the name of, of God across the, the, the sewer. So disheartening. So the question, the challenge for us is, is, are we living our life as an advertisement to God? Like, is our life on display for him? 
Right? That's why I have, you know, you guys hear me talk about the Wagner way. Like I'm trying to teach my kids, like, man, your life's on display every single day. Point to Jesus. He's the way, right? Like, like let, let, let's, let's do this. Let's let our hearts line up with behavior. Let our behavior line up with our heart. Like, let's be people of integrity here. It's a challenge for us. Is our humility, is our grace under pressure, is our love and heart situations a display of the goodness of God? Is it obvious for others to see? Does our life point to Jesus? Heart health check here. Check the label. What's going on? Does behavior match up with belief? So then Paul kind of continues to push it. Not only did they have the wrong practice, they had the wrong perspective. And this is where it gets a little interesting. Verse 25. He says this, So for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? How many times is he going to say that word? A bunch. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. All right? So it's like, what is Paul talking about here? Basically, Paul is using circumcision as an illustration that God's looking for a heart change. That's what he's looking for. Circumcision was an outward sign of an inward commitment, an inward covenant, an inward change. It was a cutting away of the flesh as a sign of entering into God's covenant with the Jewish people. It was a cultural marker that you're now part of this new community that God was building. It was a ritual, circumcision was a ritual, every male child eight years of age, a cutting away of the foreskin. It was a ritual that pointed to a reality, a ritual that pointed to the reality that you're now part of God's community. But what began to happen is this ritual, this thing that we did, this thing that the, the Jewish nation people that, that they did, it became a source of pride for them. It became like, well, well, obviously we're going to escape all what we're talking about, the judgment of God, because don't you see what we're doing? We, we, we're circumcised. We're part of this special unit. We're of this special group of people. And we're going to escape God's judgment because of, of, of our ritual, of what we're doing, of how we are living, right? This idea. And the perspective was, as long as we, this ritual was in place, then we're going to be right with God. And so Paul's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's a heart matter. Verse 25. Circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, then it doesn't even matter. Like your circumcision is, uns like it doesn't matter about like what your ritual that you've done. It matters about the heart. So what happens when a ritual doesn't point to a reality? What do you have there? An empty ritual. You have dead orthodoxy. You have just dead religion is what you have. So how does that story become our story, right? I think maybe one of the ways we can think about this for us today, baptism and circumcision, they're, they're, they're different, but they share a connection here, right? Both are worthless if without the inward reality, right? We as Christians believe in baptism, a believer's baptism, which we're going to have soon after Easter. We're so excited. But baptism is this ritual. It's an outward display being in water, being dunked under, recognizing I'm dead in Christ. My sins are buried, being raised up. I'm new. Now I have newness of life. It's a beautiful display of an inward decision. It's a ritual, this baptism, that points to the reality, right? Reality. I'm all in for Jesus. Like, this is what I'm all about. I want the whole world to see me. But if you are baptized... And there's no reality of connecting to Christ and surrendering your life to him. Then, what, then it's just an empty thing. That's what Paul's talking about with circumcision. You guys think you're all good to go because of this thing that God gave Abraham so many years ago. But, but if it doesn't point to a reality of what you actually believe and who you belong to, then it's pointless, he says. It's just might as well not be certain. It doesn't mean anything. Um, 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tim Keller. He, he, does a, he has a great book on, um, on the book of Romans, and he kind of paraphrased this section. I want to read it to you. I thought it was really, really done well. He says this, this is kind of paraphrasing verse 25 and 29. He says, so, so what if you've been baptized? So what if you're a church member? This only counts for anything if there's been a real change in your life, if your heart has been truly affected. Don't you know you're not a Christian if you're only one externally? That real Christianity is not about having confidence in external things. No, a Christian is someone who's a Christian on the inside. What matters is inner baptism, a heart membership of God's people. This is a supernatural work, not a human one. Love that. What a cool way to think about this. So check the label. Heart health here. We can easily come to church on a Sunday and think that this ritual of coming to church or the ritual, the religious activity of, of worship or communion or anything, that is going to like put us up higher standing. But God's like, no, no, that doesn't mean anything if your own life is not lined up with what you're doing. If it doesn't line up, check your label, heart health. And he kind of breaks it all back down to verse 28. He says, so for no one is a Jew who's merely one outwardly, verse 28 and 29. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, he's talking about. Like, you want to be a people of God, it starts on the inside. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. And that person's praise is going to not come from man, but from God. I love the word praise. Praise is, is, kind of brings us back to the idea of, you know, the, the word Judah, where we get the word Jew from, Judah means praise. So his praise is not from man, but from God. Look at the text there. Outward and inward, verse 28, 29. Outward and inward. Outward and inward. Are you lined up? I'm not super into history necessarily, but I am always been fascinated by um, ancient Egypt did a little research in 1922 was the discovery of King Tut's tomb. And when they found it, it took him two years to actually find his burial chambers. And when they actually went into the burial chamber of King Tut, his full name is, don't know, um, they found obviously this big, gigantic coffin. It was made out of stone. Gigantic stone coffin on each corner had like these kind of deities with these weird wings covering over when they removed the cover to that coffin there was another coffin inside of it inside that coffin it was it was made of wood overlaid with gold and um, they took that coffin apart and inside that one was another wood coffin this one was overlaid with gold also had some colored glass in it when they took that coffin apart, just like you know, the nesting egg, they took that one out. That was maybe the one you've seen online. That's the gold coffin, finally, after stone, wood coffin, wood coffin, was this solid gold coffin. Beautiful. They opened that up, and that inside of that coffin was the mask uh, that was placed on the face of the young king the one that maybe you're familiar with, uh, with, the, with the, the big beard and stuff. That was placed on his head, and underneath that was just dead bones, a dead body. Dead body wrapped in cloths, placed in a gold coffin, placed in a wooden coffin, placed in a wooden coffin, placed in a stone coffin. Why am I saying this to you? Check your labels. What's going on inside? Your outside can be very pretty. Church attendance, teaching kids ministry, helping the homeless on Tuesdays, going and visiting um, Hope Refuge on Thursdays. You can have all the right activity. But if that activity doesn't point to a reality, then you're just wasting your time. And we'll fall under the judgment of God. That's what Paul's saying. And so, check your label. How, what's going on in your heart? Is it lined up with, with what you say? Is your heart and your mind 
and your behavior and your belief, is it, is it, is it, are you a person of integrity, oneness? Now, one, one sense, it's like, well, no. I mean, I'm, I'm a sinner. I always, gonna, I'm going to fall short. What does that mean? And, and I started thinking about why does Paul use this illustration of circumcision here? And I'll invite the worship team to come up. Why does he use this illustration of, of circumcision? When God gave Abraham this outward sign of an inward reality, of his personal, intimate relationship with his creator. God promised Abraham, Abraham, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make your descendants as many as the stars of the sky. I mean, we're gonna, from you, a nation's gonna come forth. And the way I want you to enter into this promise is through the, the covenant of circumcision. Circumcision was right, like, it was a visual sign of the penalty of breaking covenant. This is what I mean. Right, in ancient times, you didn't have DocuSign, right, to sign your name on a binding agreement. What you would do is you would act out the curse that you would accept if you broke a promise. So maybe a person would pick up dust and sprinkle it on their head saying, you know, if I break this promise to you, let me be as this dust. Or, or maybe a person would cut an animal in two and walk between it and say, like, if I break this promise, may I be like this animal? May, may I be cut? May I, may I, may I die? In fact, that's the, that's the illustration we see in Genesis that God, Genesis 15, God does with Abraham, by the way. So God was saying to Abraham, right, that circumcision is, is this cutting off of a very intimate, personal, personal, tender way. And God was saying to Abraham, listen, I want to be in relationship with you, Abraham, and you need to be circumcised as a sign to you and to everyone that if you break this covenant with me and you, you're going to be cut off completely, cut off from others, cut off from life, cut off from me. But you might say, but, but wait, but wait. I mean, Paul's just telling us that no one can keep covenant. No one, no one can, is righteous before God. Like, does that mean we're going to be cut off? Does that mean we're going to be separated? How can anyone be right with God? And taking this illustration of circumcision, Paul will tell the church in Colossae, he says this, Colossians 2 verse 1, that in him, in Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I was always like, what, what does this mean? What is he talking about? And I, I think the idea is that that in his death, Jesus was cut off. He was cut off from his father. He was removed from, from connection to his heavenly father. He was cut off from the land of the living. In a sense, Jesus was truly circumcised to be cut. He was removed. He, he bore the curse of covenant breaking. He suffered the curse that lawbreakers deserved, Jesus was cut off. So Paul says, so now in Christ, when you are in Christ, in him, we're, in him we were cut off. Jesus did that for us. So now when, Christ, when God sees us, he sees us in Christ, holy and righteous and blameless. So therefore we can be people of pure hearts because the Holy Spirit now indwells in us. And we're sons and daughters of the King and we can be people of integrity. We can check our labels. As I mentioned last week, if the gospel doesn't save you, it's going to judge you. Jesus will be your judge if he's not your savior. The gospel rescues us from the wrath of God. It rescues us from guilt and shame and, and we're so thankful for it. The God in his great love for us and at a tremendous cost to himself provided a way out for us. We get to have heaven instead of hell. And only one way to deal with sin is to admit it, to acknowledge that God deals with our sin in Christ upon the cross and to accept this gift of salvation from Jesus. And so as we end our time this morning, I, I know Romans chapter one, chapter two, it's, it hasn't been puppy dog and rainbows and and uh, just great, let's go tackle the world type stuff. It's been really hard, hard things. Deep questioning, Lord, 
Does my life line up? Does my belief match up with my behavior? Does my behavior line up with my belief? Oh, Lord, reveal it to me. Thank you, Jesus, for being cut off from me. Thank you for receiving the curse so that I can receive grace. Lots to think about, lots to be thankful for. So would you stand with me this morning as we have a closing time of worship? The elders and our prayer team will be up in front, our front area also in the back. Sometimes it's kind of too loud to pray by the speakers. We'll be in the back as well. But we have some moment, a few more minutes together to respond, to react, to repent, to rejoice. So let's have our time. Father, we thank you for this moment. We do thank you for your word. We thank you that you were cut off, that you, you received the curse so that I may receive grace. Thank you so much for that, Lord. And I pray this morning, if different people, men and women, young and old here in this place, there's something that's been revealed to them in these past few moments where their life is not lined up with their belief, that there's something askew, something not right. I, we've been doing some heart health checks today. Lord, if that's something any, anywhere, any area, Lord, we want to expose it. We want to release it. We want to give it to you. We want to pray the blood of Jesus over our lives and start afresh and start anew pursuing you in a greater way. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, move in this moment right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer team's here. A few more moments ago as we worship. It's our way to respond. A way to just marinate on what God's been doing in our lives. Prayer team's here and up in the back as well. A few more moments.